Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're so glad you made it up to join us. And uh, although we may be few in numbers, it just means you get to sing twice as loud. <laughs> so we're glad to have you here this morning, uh, and uh, we look forward to worshiping together. Uh, I guess this is technically Christmas Sunday, and we get to keep celebrating. Uh, I'm going to open our service today with uh, a reading from Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Please stand and join us. <laughs> for Ella, and we thank you that Andy is there to care for her, but 
We also just ask that you lift up that entire family because it is, it is, it is difficult to care for someone when they are ill. We pray for Ken and for Linda, for uh, Ken's back and for Linda's, Linda's um, issues, and we just thank you that, uh, that they love you and that they know you so well. And we thank you for continuing to carry them through that. Lord, we also pray for uh, Cindy Deneau, who's suffering um, from injuries from a fall, and just ask that you heal her body and help ease the pain in her, in her back and her shoulder. Father, while Christmas is a joyous time for many, it is also a very sad time for some. And we'd like to take a moment and just pause and remember those who, uh, who are no longer with us at the moment. We think of Karen Crossley dealing with the death of, death of her daughter and the previous death of her son. We think of Joanne, Chad, Carter, and Justin they go through Christmas without Carson. And we, we just pray for your strength, Father, because that's not something that we can bear alone. We think of Leslie Davies and uh, the loss of her husband, Rick, and we thank you for the strength that you continue to offer her. And we think of uh, Steve Stein and the loss of um, his ex-wife, Becky, who remained a part of his life. And that's just this year. Father, there's um, Roberta and Rachel who have dealt with loss in, in the past year. My, my cousin Nancy, there's, there's so many, Lord, and we all need you. And you reach out and touch the hearts of each of us. And as we walk through our various stages of grief and unhappiness and into acceptance, we thank you that you're there with us every moment. Father, I thank you for the people who are here and just ask that you be with us in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please join me once more.
Just drop it in your pocket. Souls out this morning. I'm not sure what, what's the operative word? Fatigue. <laughs> and I do want to thank for all those who came out on Sunday, or sorry, on Friday evening, and uh, beautifully decorated. Thank you for all those who looked at that. It was a time of beauty. Just remind you that uh, I won't be here next Lord's Day, but we have a guest speaker, a gentleman from uh, Chosen People's Ministry. Uh, he's uh, Argentinian. Messianic Jew, and uh, he's going to bring a few words in Spanish to some of our Spanish speakers next Sunday as well. So we look forward to that. Well, um, let's turn our Bibles to one more Advent reading, or Christmas reading, and it's found in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to the, uh, to the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 21. I've uh, been thinking about this message as I composed it this week, and uh, I thought to myself, well, that might be just a little gloomy, uh, because there's also a great deal of joy in Christmas, so I think a more appropriate title would have been uh, The Two Sides of Christmas. So, uh, just bearing that in mind. So let's read together from verse 21. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what he said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And he had been revealed, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Daniel, the tribe of Asher, and she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until, until she was eighty-four. And she did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. May God bless his word as we have read it together. Uh, this is without doubt one of the most beautiful passages of the scripture in the entire Bible. Uh, in the church year, it's called the presentation, the presentation of Jesus uh, in the temple. And it's especially beautiful because of the human characters that are, that are involved. At the beginning, we meet an older man named Simeon, and at the end, we meet an older woman named Anna. And Simeon takes the baby Jesus in his arms, and he blesses the parents of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. And Anna testifies to others of the child. 
And yet, just in keeping with the two sides of Christmas, it is also one of the most disturbing stories in the Bible. Because Christmas, the Christmas story, is not always the stuff of Hallmark Christmas cards. Even on this occasion, a shadow is cast over the whole. Both Matthew and Luke reveal a dark side to Christmas. You will wonder why there's a dark side to Christmas, but there is. Matthew, remember, recounts the slaughter of the innocents, all the young boys, aged two and younger. The wailing of mothers who would not be comforted. Very tragic scene. Luke recounts the hard words of Simeon, not just the joyous words of Simeon, but the hard words of Simeon, both to the nation of Israel and to Mary herself. So we wonder why this is so. And I think for this reason. No truth is ever declared about Jesus without opposition. Some would welcome the message of His coming. And they will come and worship Him and fall at His feet. But others would reject the message of His coming. And they ultimately will seek Jesus' death and we read the end of the Gospels. As Jesus' birth caused division in Israel, so it causes division in our own day. Because to no one, no one can remain neutral in light of Jesus' coming. There's no neutrality. To embrace His coming means salvation and joy, but to reject His coming means sorrow and death. And so we keep this dual focus in mind as we read this passage and reflect upon it this morning. Let's ask this question taken from the hymn, and I didn't coordinate this with Mike or with Paul, but uh, here's the hymn. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? That's the question I'd like to ask of this question. Don't mind this tagging around, I'm just going to try to get along with it for that. First of all, what child is this? Jesus was a Jewish child. It goes without saying, but it bears repeating, Jesus was born a Jew. Everything about his birth is Jewish. You'll notice the law is mentioned five times in this passage of Scripture. He was born into a devout Jewish home. Mary and Joseph journeyed to the temple to perform the requirements of the law. That's why they were there in the temple. And they were law-abiding. Not only were they devout, uh, it seemed like they were also very poor. They offered simply two pigeons instead of a lamb and a turtle dove or a pigeon. So Jesus was born not to a ruler, but to a carpenter. Not to a princess, but to a young peasant girl. Second, in accordance with the law, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Remember Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. The Leviticus 12 instructed every Jewish boy, eight years old, to be circumcised in accordance with the law. It goes back to Abraham's circumcision, back there in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, he was circumcised as a sign of God's blessing and separation of his people and his family, who would one day be a blessing to the entire world. That was the sign of circumcision. Thirdly, in accordance with the law, they dedicated their firstborn son. Fourth, in accordance with the law, after 40 days, it was necessary for Mary to, fill, to fulfill the requirements of purification. After the birth of a child, the woman was unclean for seven days. And then she would be unclean for another 33 days. If the child was a boy, another 66 days, double the number, if the child was a girl. The reason being is that a girl could not be circumcised. But the whole idea was, here was someone who was separated unto God. And all told, Jesus was a very kosher savior. <laughs> He's a Jewish boy. He grew up in a Jewish home under devout parents. And when you see your Jewish doctor 
hopefully not your Jewish lawyer. <laughs> but when you meet with him next time, remind him or her that Jesus was a very good Jewish boy. And he grew up observing the entire law of Moses. You'll notice, however, that Mary's purification is never mentioned after verse 22. Instead, Luke stresses a meeting in the temple with an elderly couple named Simeon and Anna. And Simeon is described as, as being righteous and devout. He was law-abiding. He, he honored the Torah, the, the Word of God, the Hebrew Bible. And so is Anna. We read of her that she did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. These were two godly, older Jewish people who honored the Lord and obeyed His Word. And they were filled, it says, with the Spirit of God. They weren't acting haphazardly. They were both led by the Spirit of God into the temple at just the right time as Mary and Joseph were there to present the baby Jesus for his purification, for his circumcision. And both were waiting in anticipation for God's anointed, God's Messiah. Upon this meeting, Simeon pronounces two very distinct oracles. The first one is an oracle of joy. It bursts forth in the oracle what we call the Nunc Dimittis in Latin, which is the first two words, Lord now, Lord now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Here's what he's saying. For some, Jesus brings the blessings of salvation. There is a joyous side to Christmas. Yeah, it, it's, it's more than just having a turkey and gathering with family. But spiritually, there's a greater meaning to it all. There's joy, the joy of salvation. And upon meeting the Christ child, Simeon takes him up in his arm. He embraces him. And so how does Simeon apply this meeting in the temple? He applies the salvation, you notice, to himself personally wasn't just a tradition, he applies it to himself personally. He says, my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes. You see, to see Jesus, he's saying, is to see God's salvation. Simeon was looking at a child barely 40 days old. And yet he wasn't worshipping a child. Simeon is literally holding salvation, God's salvation in his arms. Here's the one foretold by the prophets many hundreds of years ago. Here's the one that God had prepared, and God had prepared Simeon's heart at the right time in the right place to receive this one who was coming into the temple. Because to have Jesus, you see, is to have salvation. He waited for this moment all his life, and now he holds this one in his arms. And he says, now I'm ready to die. You know, by nature, we are all afraid to die, are we not? I mean, look at what's happening with us right now, the COVID, the whole COVID pandemic. Um, you know, I get the concern, I'm double vaxxed. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward, I have a reservation for my booster shot come early January. Try to wear a mask, try to distance. Although some of it borders rather on the irrational, I think. Yet it is, as the writer to the Hebrews says, it is a point for us once to die and after that the judgment. But it's, it's more a matter of how to die. How to die without fear. How to die in peace. Isn't that more important? To die without regrets. Because we're going to be with Jesus. That's the challenge. And, and Simeon shows us how to die. By looking upon this salvation of God, this gift of God, come to him now in the person of Christ. The one who is now salvation. You know, I know of many people who have come to faith later in years. You may know some people as well. And to a person they've all said, why didn't someone tell me of Jesus 
earlier in my life. It seems like I've wasted my life until I'm 60 or 70 or even 80. I wish I had known him before. Nothing had truly satisfied them in all the years of their life. I took the funeral of one gentleman uh, two summers ago, who was part of our church in Meaford, and uh, he probably was in his 80s, early 80s, from England, had lived in Canada for quite a while, and uh, he, he sought meaning, he shared his testimony with me, he sought meaning and truth and purpose all his life until simply a few months before he passed away. And at the funeral I used these words of Simeon as my text. At this stage he was, body was racked with cancer and he was ready to go. So I didn't have too much trouble finding the right text for Malcolm. And now Simeon likewise is ready to go. He is ready to meet God. Now he could die in peace. You see, to see Jesus is to see God's salvation. Not only does he apply it personally, he also applies this coming son, this coming babe, to salvation globally. Simeon foresaw a universal Savior. This child will become, he says, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. You know, there are hints all the way through Luke's Gospel, if we stay with Luke, of the coming of the good news to the Gentiles. Remember how in Luke 7 he heals a, a Roman centurion? He was a Gentile. Remember the account of the ten lepers? All ten were healed, but only one came back to say thanks. It wasn't about Thanksgiving, it says he was a Samaritan. But you see, he had encountered more than physical healing. He encountered the salvation of God in Christ. The others didn't see that. See, the gospel was never the exclusive domain of Israel. But, Jesus is also the glory of his people Israel. That's what it says. God had prepared Israel for centuries for the coming of Christ. There had always been a remnant within Israel of believers waiting in anticipation for the coming of Christ. People like Zechariah and Elizabeth, who we read about in Luke chapter 1. People like Mary and Joseph. People like Simeon and Anna. It says there in the same context that Anna spoke to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. I think that was meaning they were waiting for this coming one, this Messiah, who would redeem Jerusalem, who would redeem Israel, not just politically, but also spiritually, who would be born to, go to, to redeem them from their sins. And how sad it is that the evil one has blinded the eyes of the Jewish people all through the centuries up until our day. Thank God for his brothers coming here next Sunday and he can testify to the fact that he's part of that believing community, part of that remnant. My father was a, a Christian worker, if you will, among the Jewish people. And so I saw their opposition firsthand as he would go out and witness the people on the beach front or sometimes he'd have these folk come to our own house. And I remember a father saying to his son who had believed on Christ as his Messiah, these words, I don't want to hear another word from you about him. <laughs> Sons and daughters who became as dead to parents. Such is the vehemence of their disbelief. Simeon saw Jesus as his personal Savior, but he also saw him as a, as a universal Savior. A John the Seer captures this verse in Revelation, For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed, some, you ransomed, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. But that's why we pray for missionaries. That's why we send missionaries. That's why we support missionaries. Is that all may hear the good news. All the nations hear the good news of this coming one. The one who has come. Notice the witness of Anna. She began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. You know, it's not just the 
famous preachers who bear witness to the gospel. You don't have to be a pastor or a preacher or stand behind a pulpit. It's not just the Peters and the Pauls that God uses. Far more often it's people who are quiet and yet sincere. People like Adam. There was a slogan during the Second World War that said, they also serve who stand and wait. <laughs> Anna and Simeon did a lot of waiting, but they also served. I'm sure they were a man and woman who were always given to prayer. They were praying, Lord, even so come, send this one, this redemption of our people. You know, if you are living for Christ, if you are seeking to honor Him, God is using you wherever you are. One thing you can all do, we can all do, is to pray. Pray for God's mission in the world every day. Pray for our missionaries. Pray for our church. Pray for the churches in Barry. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor who will soon come among you. Pray for your community, your next door neighbor. So much to pray for. In your own quiet way, you're fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Be faithful in your church attendance. Thank you for being here this morning. <laughs> see, to see Jesus is to see salvation. For some, Jesus coming brings gospel blessing. But you know, there is another side that you hate to speak about a dark side, but there is. Simeon prophesies a second article, and now a more somber tone is sounded. For some people, Jesus' coming brings salvation and joy, but to others, Jesus' coming brings sorrow and death. Verses 33 to 35. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. It seems as if Simeon is now with the child in his, in his arms, he's peering off into the distance and he sees acceptance, but sadly he also sees rejection. And then we read in verses 24 and 25, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign that is opposed, and his sword will pierce through your own soul also, he says to many, through your own soul, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So why was Israel guilty of this stumbling, this falling? You remember as a child when you used to run everywhere and uh, you'd always trip? Well, why would you trip? Because you weren't looking. You heard that from your mother? You weren't looking. You weren't paying attention. And Israel stumbled over a host of obstacles. Let me just name a few. Israel stumbled over Jesus' place of origin. Remember Nathaniel, what he said? But as he come, we, we found the Messiah. And uh, he, he's from Nazareth. And what does he say? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> he failed on the very first attempt. Israel stumbled over Jesus' family ties. Read in Mark 6. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and S Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. He's from the wrong family. He's from the wrong place. See, they stumbled. They weren't paying attention. And they stumbled over his spiritual insight. If you read Mark 13, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? They stumbled. This, this man is local. We know him, we know his family. Where did he get this wisdom from? Even John the Baptist stumbled over Jesus' mission. Are you the Christ? Are you the one? Or should we look for another? Even though Jesus said there's no, woman, no man born of woman greater than John the Baptist, even he stumbled when he viewed Jesus' life and mission. Can't be the right person. His own disciples stumbled over him. On one occasion he said to them, Do you still not understand? They were hard of understanding, like many of us. 
Even Mary stumbled over Jesus. Simeon predicts it in verse 35, and a sword will pierce through your soul also. You know, there were times that there was real tension between Jesus and his mother. So I want to say, just as an aside, we must not idolize Mary. Yes, she had the great privilege of being the mother of our Lord. But she was still a sinner like the rest of us. <laughs> Remember Jesus' first miracle at Canaan? They had run out of wine. And so Mary says, son, do something. She was a good Jewish mother. <laughs> do something, and then she just backed away, right? <laughs> she was a typical Jewish mother, but he was a very atypical son. So what does he say to her? Woman, what does this have to do with me? My time has not yet come. He was speaking of the cross. Mary didn't have an inkling of what he was talking about. The sword passed through her soul. You see? On another occasion, she wanted to do an intervention to rescue Jesus from a house in which he was preaching. And what did Jesus say? Who is my mother and my brothers? They are those who do the will of God. I wonder if she ever thought about that. You see, a sword was passing through her soul. And then at the end, she looked upon her own son, there hanging upon a cross. It all came to this. I thought he was someone special. The angel seemed to indicate to me that he was going to be someone very, very special. You see, and once again, a sword passed through her soul. But above all, Israel stumbled, you see, at the cross. Remember the two on the road to Emmaus? We had hoped, they said, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And now he's dead. They, the Romans hung him on a cross two days ago. What good is a crucified Messiah? It's a contradiction in terms. And so you see, they stumbled over who Jesus was. Not only was he a stumbling block, but Jesus' life and mission also functioned as a sign. Simon Simeon foretells us, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You know, thoughts in the Gospels, are always used in a negative sense. Remember when religious leaders took offense at Jesus' claim to forgive sins? What did he say? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you have questions in your heart? You see, the gospel runs contrary to all our preconceived misconceptions. Paul could say, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. Is someone very easy to stumble over because we have preconceived ideas of who he is and what he came to, to accomplish. And people still stumble, do they not? Yes, give me Christmas, lovely, marvelous, lights, family. Give me the Christmas story, yes. But the cross, not so much. I don't know if you've noticed that emphasis today. Christmas is just so much bigger than Easter. The Orthodox Church still speaks of Christmas as the winter Pascha, the, the, the winter Passover. See, some, for some Jesus' life, Jesus brings life and salvation to others. He brings sorrow and death. So again, just to close, what does this, what child is this as we sang? Well, he was a Jewish boy. He grew up in a Jewish home to devout Jewish parents. But he was a great deal more. You see, if we would worship Jesus at the manger, we must follow him to the cross. We cannot separate Christmas from Easter. The two are inextricably linked. And if the manger is filled with wonder, the cross is filled with the grace of God. 
and all may come. Let me just close with Emily Eggett's wonderful hymn. She caught some of this in her hymn, Thou didst leave thy throne. Thou camest, O Lord, with the living word that should set thy people free. But with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn, they bore thee to Calvary. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. I believe that's your prayer uh, this morning. May it be our response this day following Christmas. Let's all pray together. Lord God, this we would pray for ourselves and for all others. Prepare our hearts to receive you not only this day, but always. As we pray this in the name of him who loved us, and gave himself for us. Amen. Please join us as we can close.
Uh, the kids are doing Star Wars stuff at home. I'm like, peace. Yeah, so, yeah. See you later. So, See you later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. <laughs> 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 what?